Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you. Uh, just in case you uh, didn't catch the phone number flash at the bottom of the screen to RSVP to the volunteer appreciation event, that's my cell phone number. Um, and so if you have that, feel free to text me. If you don't, come up and ask me later and I'll give it to you. Um, there's an annual torture fest, I mean uh, race event that I put myself through every year. It's called the Dirty Dog Dash. Anybody do that? Anyway, just one? Just one? Okay, a couple people. Awesome. Some of you guys have beaten me. Some of you guys I, uh, I wait for at the end of the line. Um, but uh, it's a really fun event. It's a, it's a 5K mud run with 19 obstacles going up and down all over Boyne Mountain. Now, I've learned to love this challenge, but I will never forget the first year that I did it. Um, I'd been running 5Ks for a few years up until that point. And so when I heard about this event, I thought training for it would be kind of similar to preparing for a 5K. Boy, was I wrong. Again, I've really come to appreciate and enjoy the challenge of this event. But that first year, I thought it sounded like something really great, and I had no idea how much it would hurt. This morning, I want to talk to, from this, uh, talk to you from this idea that I didn't know mercy would hurt this much. Um... I didn't know mercy would hurt this much. Sometimes we have this idea about the mercy of God and we think it's going to be so great and we think it's going to be kind of our idea of what mercy is like and then we pray for God to like be merciful to us and show us and come in and, and, and intervene in our situation and, and sometimes we don't realize that mercy can be severe. Uh, this is week number three in our new series called The Gospel B.C., uh, where we're seeing hints of God's grand redemption plan dropped throughout all the Old Testament, and where we see um, Jesus kind of pictured or foreshadowed in the Old Testament. And so this morning, we're going to be in the book of Jonah, okay, the book of Jonah. Now, I absolutely love the book of Jonah. Uh, sometimes when people ask me, what's your favorite book of the Bible? My pastor answer is, whatever book I'm reading, and I mean it. Um, but if they press me further, this is one of those books that's just so fascinating to me. It's this comic satire of a re uh, religious hypocrite who rebels and runs from his own God. And his sin has caused him to go into such a spiritual slumber, while at the same time his life has become a wrecking ball to the lives of everyone else around him. And um, what we're going to see this morning is Jonah has this encounter with his own death. He faces death itself as he's swallowed up, and he gives us uh, this stunning glimpse into the heart of God and his grand plan to redeem all of humanity. So I, I think it could be one of the more striking images in all of the Bible. So if you have your Bibles open, uh, turn to Jonah chapter 1, verse 15. Okay, Jonah chapter 1, verse 15, and we're going to read this together. So if you're able to, would you just go ahead and stand up with me? We're going to read Jonah 1, 15 through verse 4 of the next chapter out loud together. It goes like this. Then the sailors picked up Jonah and threw him into the raging sea. And the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple." And looks, let's together look towards God's holy temple. Jesus, I, I pray that you'd speak to us in your word, that you'd reveal yourself to us this morning. Um, there are those of us who uh, here this morning who are, who are very religious, who are very familiar with the ways of God, much like Jonah, um, and maybe have gotten complacent. I pray that you would speak fresh to our hearts. There are those of us uh, who might be running from God, 
Like th- there, there's a call, there's a cost to following you, and it's actually not that desirable, and yet it's the call and the purpose of God on our lives, and, and it's like scares us, and um, we're like, I don't know if I want that. Um, God, I pray that you would reveal your goodness to us if that's the case. There are those who, much like Nineveh, um, are just loving the, the, the grand kingdom we live in of our own making that has nothing to do with God. And I pray, Lord, that you would wrestle attention away from self and draw it to you and to your glory, God. I pray that you would inspire us with a grander view of who you are and draw us to yourself. I pray um, for those who, are, um, who don't know you this morning, that you would save them, you would rescue them and and uh, cleanse them from their sin. And so we pray that you would work in powerful ways as your word is going forward today. Lord, I know uh, I'm just a vessel. So as, as I'm speaking your word, I pray that you would speak through my words and they would rest heavy on all of our hearts here this morning. Encourage, challenge, convict, motivate, um, draw us to yourself, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. Now, Here's the fascinating thing about the book of Jonah. It's, it's, it's incredibly dramatic as it's written. And so you get to verse 17 and you read, Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. And you would think at that point, oh no, poor Jonah, that's the end of his story. Like you would not think at all He was inside the fish for three days and three nights and think, oh, he has a chance. Like, that's not the conclusion you typically come to in a scenario like this. And yet we get to verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 1, and you're like, he's not dead. What? What is going on here? He's not dead. He's in the belly of the fish. And what's he doing? He's composing a prayer to God in the form of this beautiful, intricate Hebrew, Hebrew poetry. Like, you know, like what like each one of us would do in that scenario. Like this is this is bizarre what's happening and what we read in the pages of scripture here. But before we really try to draw a meaning out of this, what I want to do, and I think it's really important to do, is understand what's going on in the context of this really fascinating narrative. And if we're gonna do that, we need to start by asking, what kind of book even is this? What kind of book is the book of Jonah? Now the, the first verse of this book starts like this, Jonah 1, verse 1, and the Lord gave this message to the son of Jonah, or to, to Jonah, son of Amittai. Now, question, the Lord gives messages to what kinds of people? Answer, prophets, okay? The Lord gives messages to tell his people, he gives those messages to the prophets. Uh, and so this book occurs among the prophets of the Hebrew Bible, um, what we refer to as the Old Testament. That's its context, but you have, to under, you have to back up and even go, like, what are the prophets all about? Okay, so if you've read any of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, right? If you've read anything, you know, from, from uh, Ecclesiastes, oh, that's wisdom, uh, from Isaiah all the way through the end, through Malachi, if you've read any of the major prophets or the, the minor prophets, um, it might be fairly difficult to understand, Okay, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I bet there'd be a lot of hands went up if I said raise your hand if you find some of the Old Testament prophets, di- prophets difficult to understand, right? I bet there'd be not very many hands that go up if I asked, hey, who's doing their devotions through, you know, I don't know, the book of Ezekiel or Jeremiah or Hosea or Nahum, any Nahum, right? It's like, I don't really know if I go there that often, <laughs> I don't really get a lot out of it. Uh, And and so it's a difficult uh, thing to understand sometimes, but on a certain level, if you kind of if, on a certain level, if you, if you just basically understand the concept of the prophets, it's not actually that difficult. The basic plot line of the prophetic books kind of goes like this. Um, this is the story of Israel. God redeems his people out of slavery. He brings them to a covenant relationship with himself. He gives them instruction on how they're supposed to live as a holy witness among the nations. And so then he brings them into the promised land. And how well do they do at... at um, living in covenant relationship with God, who redeemed them, uh, not very well. They've abandoned God. They've rebelled against God. And so, uh, 
we see as we read uh, the, the narrative in the Old Testament, they've given their allegiance to other gods, they've idolized objects and they've turned them into gods, and it leads them into injustice and sin and abandonment and faithlessness to God. And when the prophets come on the scene, all the books of the prophets are about this. They accuse Israel of their sin and their faithlessness, and they warn Israel that if they don't turn from their ways, they're going to deal with the consequences of their decisions. Israel or the surrounding nations, that is. Uh, which is ultimately, you know, the big bad empire from, from far away that comes in and swoops them in, uh, swoops in and, and captures them and takes them back to that big bad empire again. They haul off God's people into slavery, into exile. So this is a huge theme in the prophets. This is what you're doing. Here's what's going to happen if you don't turn. But God's commitment to his promises to his people is even stronger than their rebellion. And the prophets always look forward to this other side, this other time on the other side of captivity where God has preserved a remnant for covenant relationship with him. That's the prophets. That's the basic plot line of every major or minor prophet in the Old Testament simplified. There's a lot more complexity to it, so we're not going to go into that. But that's, that's the basic concept. And Jonah occurs among the prophets. The prophets are about this rebellious people of God who are faithless and abandon their God. They suffer the consequences, but God's grace redeems them and brings them out on the other side. And so while all the other books... Are, of the prophets are collections of words from prophets that are about this. The book of Jonah is the only story among the prophets, a story about a prophet, and it's exactly the same storyline. Okay? So you've got this prophet who has a relationship with God, and he's got a call on his life, and he rebels against God, and he runs and he turns and does his own thing, right? And so God sends in this great terrible occupier, the one to step in and swoop in and capture him and take him somewhere else. And there's a preservation of the remnant on the other side that God intervenes in the moment and brings him through on the other side for relationship with him. And so just put yourself for a moment in the story of Jonah. Um, Jonah's running from God and he's actually quite proud of himself at first, right? Right? He gets the ticket to Tarshish. He gets on the boat. He's finally declared autonomy from God. He's made it. He's down to the, the, the seas, and he's sailing with the wind flowing in the back of his hair. And then all of a sudden, it all catches back up to him. And it's this rock-bottom moment that he finally hits. And this is where we catch up with him in chapter 2. It's a picture to God's people of their own entrapment, their confusion, their hardship, their pain, their oppression, their confinement, and as in Jonah's case, a mess of their own making. And in this chapter, we're going to hear Jonah pray through this hardship and suffering. So, so let's take a slower journey through this prayer for a moment. Jonah chapter 2. And as we do, I would invite you to use it as a way to maybe process your own journey with God to be honest before God. Jonah 2, we'll start at verse 2 again. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have, I'm sorry, that you threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank into the heart of the sea, and the mighty waters engulfed me, and I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. And then I said, Lord, you have driven me from your presence. Yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. Now this is really interesting because when we hit rock bottom, in that space, in that moment, we often feel that God is not listening. It feels like God is nowhere to be found at rock bottom. But here, Jonah comes to the exact opposite conclusion, right? He says, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. 
I called to you from the land of the dead, Lord, and you, you heard me. When he hits rock bottom, he becomes more aware than ever that God is right there with him. He draws the conclusion that in those moments, God is actually closest and most attentive. And then he says something very interesting. Notice, notice verse 3. Whose waves does he say are crashing over him? The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Who threw him in the heart of the sea? Okay, in verse 15 of chapter 1, we read, it was the sailors. But here, who does Jonah say hurled him into the sea? See, this is, this, is, this is a really deep and difficult truth to wrestle with. Once he reaches the bottom of the sea, he's beginning to see God's involvement and divine hand at work in all of the ser- scenarios, the circumstances that led him to this point, including him getting thrown out of the boat. Just step back for a moment and just remember how this story is playing out. Who ultimately is responsible for Jonah getting into this particular mess? Is it God's fault that Jonah made sinful decisions? No. Is it God's responsibility? No. Jonah is the responsible one for all of the calamity that led him to this point. But Jonah sees that regardless of whose fault it is that lands him in this moment, God is not surprised. Jonah sees that somehow God is still sovereignly working out his grace-filled plan at the same time that the human beings around him are performing actions for which they are responsible, for which he is responsible. This is the beautiful and mysterious interplay between, that we see this a lot in scripture actually, between God's sovereignty Meaning like God's orchestrating events happening. He's, he's ruling. He's in charge. And man's responsibility for the actions he takes with his own free will. Scripture does not resolve these two, by the way. It holds them in tension. And, and we call it a paradox. It's a beautiful mystery. Yes, God is working out his plan in the landscape of history, and yes, man is responsible for the actions he performs with his free will, right? Verse 15, then the sailors picked up Jonah and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. Chapter 2, verse 3, you threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank into the heart of the sea. And then here's the crazy thing, when Jonah is at his lowest point, he wakes up to the severe mercy of God. It's a severe mercy. It's, it's very severe. And at the same time, it's very merciful. And Jonah sees God's fingerprints all over this moment. Even though Jonah has made the decisions that led him here, God is present and active in this circumstance. And so here's, here's the hard thing that a lot of Christians have to wrestle with. I think a lot of us have this subtle assumption that at one point we invited God into our lives to help us deal with the difficulties of life and kind of smooth out the road ahead of us along our chosen destination and hopefully with a little security and comfort and safety along the way. Jesus, please come into my heart and I'll follow you as asterisk as long as it's a pretty smooth road. And this is a problem because if your idea of God is that his greatest priority is to make you safe or comfortable or happy, you're going to have a really hard time trusting and following God because your whole faith experience will begin to expose how naive a view of God that is because that's not the God revealed to us in the Bible. According to the Bible, God's highest priority is to make me like his son Jesus and even he was not ex- spared from extreme suffering. Right? And so if God's priority is to make me like Jesus, I have to accept that in his severe mercy, he might deal with me in ways that bring me to the end of myself. And I may even resent him for that. 
But the paradox of God's severe mercy is that it could be the best thing that ever happens to me because I discover the truth of how broken and selfish I am. I discover the truth that I take my life for granted as if I just had the final say of everything in my life and I can make it go on my way. And I discover that the only reason I exist is because of the intention of somebody else and that I'm not the authority in my life. And it brings me to this place of, of dependence. And humility, which ultimately is a place of being connected to the greatest provision there is. And this is where Jonah finds himself. So how do you process a severe mercy? Jonah makes this key statement in verse 4. He said, I said, O Lord, you have driven me from your presence. Now think about this. That's what Jonah wanted. Right? Jonah wanted nothing more than to be driven from the presence of God. To be separated from God. To be be distant from Him. That's what he was doing. He was running away. He's like, I don't want what you want for me, God. I want what I want for me. And please, don't chase me down. He wanted separation from God's presence. He, and he confesses he believes he actually achieved that. He got what he wanted, and, and this is the turning point for him. This is the face palm moment, because like, I got whatever, uh, what I always wanted. I, I, I was finally free from you, God, and now I'm going to seek your presence again. Wh- why? Lord, you've driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more to your holy temple. What's going on here? Here's the thing, seeking all the things I ever wanted just led me to the depths. This is what Jonah's realizing. I crashed and I burned. This is, a, this is a profound truth that you need to grasp, that sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go. It will keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and it will, make, it will cost you more than you want to pay. Th- this is the deception of sin. It seems like a good escape, and yet it never gives up. It will take you further than you wanted to go, make you stay longer than you wanted to stay, and it's going to cost you more than you wanted to pay. And so Jonah says, as I got all I ever wanted, I became painfully aware. I woke up to the fact that it was truly horrible. It wasn't worth it. Aiming for Tarshish was the worst thing I could have ever wanted. Verse 5, so I sank beneath the waves. And the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. And I sank to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates locked shut forever. But you. But you, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. See, a lot of people today... Probably most people live under the delusion that they don't need God. That, that their life is going fine just the way things are. Um, and that, that living for the things that make life about me is really, that's the point of my life. As long as I can be satisfied, as long as I can be happy. Uh, but at some point we're going to realize that even if we got everything we always wanted, it will never be truly enough to make us feel alive. So Jonah realized that whether he got all that he ever wanted or he sank to the very bottom, God was still there. And when he finally hits bottom, he finally realizes that the only thing he has in life that's going for him is that God is committed to him. This whole time, God was working out his plan for his glory and for Jonah's good, even though it took a severe mercy to grab a hold of Jonah's attention and wake him up to this. And this is what motivates him to say this next thing, verse 7. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. My earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their back on all God's mercies, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. I will fulfill all my vows. It finally occurs to him that the life that he wanted was fleeting, it was ebbing away, And the only one still with him is God. 
on his way to Tarshish as he was running from God. He was totally ignoring everything that God had done for him, all the ways that God had blessed him. But then ironically, at the very lowest point of his life, when all the pleasures and all the distractions are removed in God's severe mercy, he finally brings these memories of God's goodness back to his mind. All the while, where is he? Where has he not left? He's in the belly of the beast. He's in the digestive stomach, swimming in acidic enzymes in a great fish. He's in the place of death as he's having this really positive turn to gratefulness, right? This is, this is crazy. This is not supposed to be happening. He, this is the paradox of God's mercy. It totally strips away all of the lies and the distractions that we've been surrounding ourselves with our whole lives. It finally removes the clutter and brings us to the truth of who we are before a holy and glorious God. And we finally realize that the only thing that we have going for us is the faithfulness and the grace of a God who is totally committed to us. And so this powerful moment, this powerful realization motivates him to worship. The realization that there's absolutely nothing that can reduce or threaten God's faithfulness and commitment to him, compels him to praise God with this renewed sense of commitment to him. So he says, I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. I'll fulfill all my vows, for salvation comes from the Lord alone. This, this is turned into a praise session. This is turned into unreserved gratefulness. And, and, and here's the crazy thing. He is still in the belly of the fish, Right? It's really easy for you to look ahead to verse 10, because it's right there on the same page, and not be too nervous about how things are going to turn out for Jonah. You need to understand this. Jonah is praying in verse 9. He has no idea verse 10 is coming. God didn't say, oh, I'm going to put you in this fish for three days. He thinks this is indefinite. So he's, he says, my salvation comes from the Lord alone. He has finally begun to praise God for rescuing him, not from the fish. He's not thanking God for saving him from the fish. Because that hasn't happened yet. Get this, he's beginning to praise God for rescuing him from the worthlessness and the faithlessness and the idolatry and the spiritual slumber and the sinfulness and the pride and the racism and the hate and the selfishness in his own heart. He is praising God for saving him from him. And he begins the process of repentance. Now, obviously, if you keep reading, he's got a ways to go. But he begins the process of repentance, and as he does, he sees the rescue and redemption of God before he's ever released from the fish. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Here's the point. The wounds of mercy lead to life. In other words, divine justice says that I should get what I deserve. A life consumed with self and separated from God for all of eternity. But it's God's mercy that rescues me from that delusion and gives me the opportunity to turn onto the life-giving pathway of a relationship with God as much as it might hurt. And this pathway has a road name. It's called repentance. It doesn't go the same direction that we want to go in life. But the wounds of mercy lead to life, lead to a flourishing life on the pathway of repentance. And this is certainly what the writer of Jonah intends us to grasp as we're in the belly with Jonah. It's about conviction and humility and repentance. But there's something about this moment that transcends Jonah's current experience. There's something that Jesus himself points to when he talks about this moment. If you have your Bible, turn to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 12. Okay, Matthew chapter 12 As you're turning there, you realize that, that this book, right, has 66 books within it that are, that are penned by a number of different writers over the span of three millennia, but it has one author, amen? It has many writers, but it has one author. And the writer of Jonah is being very intentional with his words to help us grasp 
the point of the text, but there is an author who is above the one writing these words. He is the one inspiring the writer to put pen to paper in this way, and he is the Word of God. This divine author, the Word of God, Jesus, says that there is something even greater happening as Jonah is in the belly of the fish. Matthew 12, verse 38. One day, some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. And Jesus replied, Only an evil and adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign, but the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And the people of Nineveh will stand up, this is why he says this, by the way, this is what he's getting at, the point that he's drawing to is this, the people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it, for they repented of their sin at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. There's a few things I want to draw out for a moment as we close. The ways that Jonah points forward to Jesus. What's, what's really going on in the mind of the author as he's giving us these beautiful and intricate and complex and fascinating texts of Scripture? What is he trying to communicate to us? First, both Jonah and Jesus received a mission from God to go preach However, Jesus willingly obeyed uh, while Jonah refused and only obeyed reluctantly once God grabbed a hold of him. Number two, both went down to the place of death for three days. Number three, both were delivered from their trip to the depths, but Jesus was resurrected and offers that same resurrection to anyone who would follow him. Number four, both preached a message calling people to repent uh, in the face of impending judgment, but Jonah gave as little of effort as possible. Jesus preached relentlessly for years, had the power to forgive sins, and ultimately gave everything, even though it cost his life. And finally, both saw sinners repent and believe in God for the forgiveness of sins. That being said, Jonah hated the ones who repented and didn't actually want God to save them. Jesus rejoiced when sinners, especially Gentiles, repented and believed. And I think only when we read the rest of the story in the New Testament do we see the grand redemption plan for all of humanity uh, that Jonah had been pointing us to all along. A greater prophet, a greater preacher, a greater savior. One who had not only the power to forgive sins, but the desire to save anyone who would come to him and believe on him and and repent and, and choose to follow him. And that was so consuming for him, so much of a mission that was in the central focus of his mind, that it took him all the way to the point of the cross to demonstrate how much God hates sin, and also at the same time, how much he yearns for sinners to repent and come to him and find eternal love. It's at this point of the cross that we see a severe mercy. At a very extreme moment that offers a pathway to new life. The wounds of mercy still lead to life. The mercy of God shown in the wounds of Christ lead all who repent and put their faith in Jesus to resurrected life. See, the wicked generation that Jesus mentioned standing before them standing before them was a greater Jonah a greater three day event a greater message and a greater result but the one thing that wasn't greater was the reception to this you notice this many of the people standing before Jesus that day would actually not choose to follow him would not choose to turn away from their own kingdom of self. They chose not to repent. And therefore, Jesus is saying that one day, these previously pagan believers from Nineveh that repented when Jonah preached, they're going to rise up and judge them, something totally unthinkable for Jesus' Jewish audience. Like, they don't ever get to stand in a place of judgment of us. 
We're the people of God. But why are they in that position? Because when they heard the word, when they received the severe wounds of mercy, they chose to turn and receive new life. What about you? Today, God is inviting you on the pathway of a resurrected life. A life that has is, that is died to your selfishness, that has died to your pride, and has surrendered to God's purposes. How are you going to respond? The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it, for they repented of the sins of the preaching. They repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now, someone greater than Jonah is here. Someone greater than Jonah is here. Will you repent? I want to ask you three questions and we'll be done. Number one, what is it that you're chasing in your life? Is there a purpose or an aim in your life that you're chasing that doesn't come from God? Is it the perfect image of what your family is supposed to look like? Is it a greater degree of respect in your career? Is it more freedom or wealth or attention? Anything that you pursue in your life that you wouldn't want to let go of today if God asked you to is an idol that you're running toward, that you're worshiping. And when you're running toward an idol, you're not running towards God. In fact, you're running away. So can I state the obvious? Stop running from God. He's not the monster. He's not the one trying to steal your life. He's not the one trying to ruin what your life is designed to be. He's the one who knows how it's designed to be the best. Stop running from God. There is no purpose that is worth more than the prize of hearing God's approval and receiving his affection. Second question, what sin is God pointing out in your life? Here's the deal. It's really easy to want to resist the voice of God that hurts, that cuts deep, that feels like a severe wound. God is not convicting you because he's against you. He's not highlighting sin in your life because he really loves nitpicking you and pushing you down. But instead, he knows it's killing you and it's driving a wedge between him. Is, is there a stronghold of greed or lust or anger or laziness or gluttony or pride or even envy that's, that you're just harboring in your life and God's been pointing that out? It's been a thing and you're just like, I, I'm trying to tune you out, God, the longer you hold on to it, the longer you make excuses for it, the longer you're letting the rot of sin and, and selfishness poison your life and hold you back from the fulfillment and the freedom and the fullness of life that God has prepared for those who love him wholeheartedly. That every single compartment, every room, every space in your heart is totally open and exposed to God and available for him. So the encouragement here is to repent, turn from your sin, kill it, leave it behind, run back to him. I promise you, walking in freedom with God is infinitely better. It is worth every ounce of pain it takes to confess and to repent and to walk in a different direction, to walk towards the one who's offering you new life. And number three, are you a believer or just an agreer. Here's what I mean. It's one thing to know and agree with certain historical facts. To know certain things about God like Jonah did. It's one thing to know about the Lord. It's another thing to put your faith in him. Let me say it another way. It's one thing to look like a Christian. It's another thing to look like Christ. It's one thing to let God have a couple hours on a Sunday morning a few times a month. It's another thing to let him have every day for the rest of your life. What I'm saying here is there's a difference between speaking the lingo and serving the Lord. 
And here's how you will know you believe him instead of just knowing facts about him. You'll let him use you for his purposes as you live a resurrected life. It's one thing to be an agreer. It's another thing to be a believer. I believe you, God. I trust you, God. I, I will bank my life on it. Rather than, oh, I just agree with what the pastor says on a Sunday morning. That's not faith. There is a, there is a pathway to fulfilling fullness in life. There is a pathway to resurrected life. And it doesn't go the same direction that we typically choose in our own selfishness to go in life. And so in order to experience the fullness of resurrected living that Jesus is inviting us to, we have to turn. It's the Bible word for repenting. We turn a different direction and start going in a different direction. And it's, sometimes it takes a severe mercy to get us to that point. My encouragement for you this morning is don't, re don't resist the severe mercy of God because the wounds of mercy lead to life. If God is disciplining you, if God is chastising you, if God is causing a wound, it's because he's trying to lead you to life. because he loves you don't resist the love of God there are times I need to correct my children in a way that their brain remembers the pain and they avoid the thing that could ultimately kill them the wounds of mercy lead to life and so the mercy of God shown in the wounds of Christ are inviting you to repent and choose new life with God stop running from God Repent and turn from your sin and let God use you for his purposes as you live a resurrected life. The wounds of mercy are beckoning you, calling you to new life. So live a new life in his unfailing mercy that will never give up on you from a God who is totally committed to you, even to the depths. Let's pray. Jesus, you went to the depths to make the mercy of God accessible to us. That the severe mercy of God consumed you. And yet on the other end of this, when you resurrected to new life, you offer us a new life. God, I pray for those who are resisting the pathway of your life. Oh, Lord, I pray in your mercy and your grace and your kindness that you would wake us up to your goodness and your greatness. Help us to choose a life that is truly fulfilling and truly um, filled with purpose and hope and healing. Help us to choose to receive the merciful ways you're dealing with us in our life. Give us the awareness. Give us the capacity to see what you're actually up to and what you're doing in our life, Lord. And, and as you're pointing out the direction, I pray that it wouldn't take a severe mercy, but that our hearts would be tuned in to the frequency of your voice and yearn to follow it for the rest of our days. So pray this in Jesus' name.